shorter message this morning, but then when I looked down at my watch after everything was said and done, I realized we're going to go the full 90 minutes for the service today. So, <laughs> sorry about that. I don't take that as a warning. I think it was, I thought it was, it was nice. Good Shepherd Sunday is a good, a good service. Yeah, I got, I, got, I got time to make up. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to do the, the summarize the last couple of questions on the back of lesson 19. So we'll just have a couple of questions there. We'll talk about that. Um, and then we'll start the new lesson. And actually, uh, the new lesson is kind of a shorter one. Uh, only five questions. Only five questions, but it only, it's only four verses. So um, it's a little bit smaller. We're going to take chapter 7 in a little bit bite-sized chunks as we navigate through this new chapter. Before we get started, as always, let's go ahead and open up with prayer. Lord, we thank you for today, for the gift of being able to gather together as your sheep and your pasture, knowing that you call us each by our name, knowing us intimately and personally, and, and knowing everything that we bring, all of the, the sorrow, the brokenness, the shame, the guilt, and how you mend us back as your children and people through your blood and your forgiveness and, and your resurrection. We ask that you lead and navigate us through our conversation today, resting solely on your grace and on your mercy and seeing how that brings us all together. We ask this in Jesus' name. So real quick, how many of you guys were here last Sunday for the videos? What did you guys think? The lost, it was the lost books of the Bible. Yeah, it talks about Gnostic Gospels, all sorts of fun stuff. I thought that might be a fun one since the first, the first video that we watched uh, last year was uh, a case for the Bible or something like that, or how we got the Bible. So I thought this one was uh, with all the what? They found the lost books in the fertilizer. They found the lost books in the fertilizer, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, so let's go ahead and talk about the last three verses in Romans chapter 6. So I'll go ahead and read through uh, these last three verses, starting in verse 20, um, um, and, and, and then we'll dive into some of these other passages, uh, Matthew, Galatians, and Ephesians, and then we'll go to verse 11. So, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at the time up from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, uh, in this, we have, in the final three verses of Paul, of the text, Paul adds the additional metaphor of fruit. So read Matthew 12, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5, and what is Paul trying to teach his hearers? So does somebody, would someone mind looking up that Matthew passage and another person interested in looking up the Galatians 5, Fruit of the Spirit, and then that Ephesians 5 passage as well. <coughs> Do we have a volunteer already for the, the Matthew 12? Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree, tree corrupt and its fruit <coughs> For the tree is known by its fruit. For generations of fighters, how can you be evil speak good things? Out of the abundance of the earth, the mouth speaketh. Right. And so what he's looking at, at here in Matthew 12, where Jesus is talking about, look at the product, look what it's producing. Is it good? And you can discern the tree based on its fruit. We talked about this a little bit last time, talking about looking at why is it called an apple tree. It's called an apple tree because it bears apples. You wouldn't call a, a tree and you have... Barb called me a fruitcake, right? Because if I was a tree, what would you call me? But so it was funny. Um, <laughs> uh, so here you have that. Uh, so you have that. And we're going to see this even more. We're looking at what the fruit is. What is, what is it producing? So what is the sin in us producing? This is what Paul is talking about. using this metaphor. What did the sin produce versus what does the faith produce? So how about the Galatians 5 passage? 
for us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Okay. So again, you know, you're looking at uh, what it is that springs up in us. What is the product of the righteousness and of the faith that is living in and through us as Christ lives in and through us? How about the Ephesians 5 passage? Is that where, where we're at? Is Ephesians 5? Yeah, 9 and 12. For the fruit of life is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead escape them. Yeah. So again, and the, I think the, the most important word, I think I talked about this a little bit a couple weeks ago, is talking about the word discern. You know, when you're walking through an orchard, how do you know which tree is what? And, and even dis, dis, uh, discerning between different types of certain things. You know, different types of apples, different types of pears, different types of grapes. You know, you're going through and you're looking to see what it yields and what the product is. You're not bringing down judgment or wrath or condemning or anything like that. You're simply looking at what the product is. And this is where we have, if you live your life according to sin, you're going to yield death. The destruction, the wages of sin, I and mean, he uses wages at the very end, kind of shifting metaphors on us very abruptly. But uh, the, pro the product of living life according to sin is death. But living life according to faith, being rejuvenated in Christ and Him living in and with, through us in this righteousness, we get to see life, an abundant life. And you get to see the things that are on the hallmarks of that faith. <clears throat> Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, gentleness. Those things that don't come naturally to us. Um, those are the things that we constantly have to work on. And, I mean, we all, always joke about the things that we always pray for. We always pray for, for patience. Right? Uh, we always pray for extra gentleness. It's not something that, that uh, you know, some of us might be uh, a little bit better at it than others. Right? But we need that intervention and that cultivating in our life so that we can truly um, express this non-self-serving fruit of the Spirit. Because the world can be gentle, you know, in, in some respects, patient. But there is, you know, when everybody talks about there's always an angle. When we're talking about living in righteousness, it's living free from those types of things. And just honestly living, uh, expressing that gentleness and yielding that, uh, that, that fruit to the kingdom. Any questions about that so far? Okay. All right, let's go on down to the, the last question and finish up this worksheet. But what did I do? I forgot to get myself. Oh, you forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so it says with the final verse, Paul uses a play on words as he makes a distinction between wage and a gift. Ah, yes. What point is he making? How has sin, sin earned death? So let's go back and let's look at this. You, know, you see Paul using words so like surgically as he makes his way through them. So, uh, for the wage of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So he is juxtaposing these two realities. Wages and gift. Okay, so he's making this really, so what is it? What is, what is he trying to teach you by just using these different words? What does the word wage bring into mind? You earned it, right? Yeah, this is, this is what you have earned. It is yours. This is what's coming to you. Right? Uh, this is what you've worked for, is death. And so there's all sorts of things that, that he is bringing to mind by just using that word. But then again, and at the same, you know, as he juxtaposes it, is that that's, you're not, he doesn't just say the, the wage of faith is righteousness and eternal life. No, he continues to hammer this into our mind, that this eternal life and this grace that we experience is a free gift. 
It's not something you could earn or ever earn. So, just question. Yeah. There are some cases where some very evil men uh, in their lives, no doubt, indirectly produce a lot of improvements for mankind. Mm -hmm. I think of King Henry VIII is an outstanding example. Yeah. Well, people talk about that too, and, and there was a big thing that came, you know, like during Nazi Germany, there's this theory called a fruit of the serpent, right? Is these good things that happen in spite of the evil. You know, look at all the horrible things that happened in the Holocaust, and, and, and then people point to, well, it's because of that we have a lot of medical tech or advancements, you know, so you try to look for the good and the bad. Um, My question basically is this Does God use evil people upon occasion to accomplish his goals and ambitions? Well, and here's that's a good question. So let's take an example. Um, I'll use my, my Nazi Germany example, right? So the question was Did God use the Nazis to bring about a good? He didn't. We can't say that, that, right? but what we can say is that God um, uses all things for his good. So the evil that those men and those leaders and women included uh, uh, carried out on their fellow uh, brothers and sisters, sometimes, sometimes literally, um, that was evil. But yet God was able to use things to bring about good. One was, you know, the unification of the West and, and a lot of the other types of things too. So it's not that God caused that evil to take place, but he does possess the ability to yet reign in and through it. And that was one of the things even Bonhoeffer wrote about while he was in, um, uh, uh, in the concentration camps, is that, you know, you're talking about everything is lost Every, you know, everything is lost life is in this. Why am I even here? I'm going to die anyways. And then he talks about one of his 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 aha or epiphany moment where he had this, you know, almost God showing up to him and saying, What are you talking about? You haven't lost anything. God is still reigning. And that God, even if even if this ends in Bonhoeffer's death, it doesn't mean the kingdom's over. Right? And that Christianity's lost. And that evil's triumph. <laughs> yeah. You know what he did? Before he went back to Germany, he, he toured America. He came over here because he was supposed to come over here on visa and teach. They were trying to save him, you know, from being persecuted and all that other stuff. And he toured the LCMS churches, the pastors here, and he wanted to listen to us preach. He returned back to Germany because he said there's not a single good preacher in America. <laughs> He's right. No. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. And that's the thing is that you have, especially through these writings um, of him and talking about, you know, it's not that God caused the evil, um, it's that God reigns in and through it. And you have examples of that even in, uh, even in the Old Testament where you have the Assyrian um, and the Babylonian uh, exiles and things like that. Even Pharaoh, right? Uh, reigning in and through um, dark and evil, hardened hearts. Uh, just because the individual, um, his mind and heart are set on certain things, doesn't change God's control or his ability to reign and use all things for his good. That's why, you know, a lot of times people say, you know, they, they take that passage, you know, Pastor Ziggy was here, he says, this is his favorite passage, eight, Romans 8 28, God uses. All things for good for those who love him. Um, and, you know, I hear individuals talk about all sorts of things. Illnesses, divorces. Oh, well, this, is, this must be what God wants because God promises that, that this will all end up good in the end. That's not at all what that passage means. The passage doesn't mean that God wants the divorce because that's what's going to be best for you. Or God wants you to have cancer because that's what's good. At the end of it, you'll, be, you'll see this as, uh, you know, so, such a good thing. Um, <clears throat> what that means is that God possesses the ability and actually carries out his reign in and through all of that brokenness to show you that he is still your good shepherd, still caring for you, providing for 
in spite of the brokenness of this world. So the cancer or the divorce in itself is not a good thing and not what God intends. Same thing with Nazi Germany. It's not what God intends. That evil to be carried out, the gulags, all those other things. Even the, the suffering that we see on the news today, the wars in Sudan and all over the place. This is not God's heart. This is not what he wants. But yet God promises to not leave us or forsake us, but work in and through it all to bring about his good. And what, what is God's good? It's about having his will be uh, touch the lives of everyone. His word, his love continue to be proclaimed. That is, uh, and, and to have us have a preserved relationship with him as he holds on to us in spite of all the tumult of, of, the, of the life that we live. So, because there's future generations that need to be born before he does. I, I always go back to that in my mind, how neat that is. You know, you, you, we always wonder, well, what's he waiting for? Why doesn't he just make all things new? If he, instead of just using, trying to be, you know, trying to reign in and through all this stuff, why didn't he hit, hit the reset button? Well, it's because your great-grandchildren's great-grandchildren haven't been born yet. And they need to be born so that they can hear the word of God, come to faith, be baptized, and join you in the kingdom. So you're suffering these, these sufferings today for the sake of them. This is why... Paul talks about sharing the sufferings of Christ because we bear the crosses in this world so that future generations yet unborn can still hear because we have no comprehension of how big that sea, that multitude is that it gathers around the throne of the Lamb. Right? In, uh, in that verse 23, that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I've always had an issue with the word eternal uh, because if you go to the dictionary it means no beginning and no end. But in John chapter 3 Jesus is speaking about what eternal life is. And uh, I'll read a little bit before that. His Father, the hour has come to glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those who have given you have given him. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Yep. So that that gives me a biblical understanding. And even if you go just a little bit further into the into the high priestly prayer, the high priestly prayer talks about that we be united as Christ and the Father are united, and that we be united to Jesus, and that we but and that we be united to God through that whole em emphasis. And so this is it: is how are we given eternal life? Is being United, grafted in, woven in, fused with, with the all the eternal. Because I know that when you think about the world, the eternal, like you said, the definition, especially if you're thinking about math, and, you know, all that other stuff, uh, you're thinking about no beginning or no end. So how is that possible? Because we obviously had a beginning. Well, it's because we're grafted into who Jesus is, into His eternal. Because there's only one eternal. See, pretty soon we're going to be getting to that Athanasian Creed. And you're going to hear that statement. One eternal, not three eternals. Right? Even though that sounds very monotonous and, and boring, that, that creed is really, is really something. And, but it's, uh, it's good. Any other questions or thoughts? Is, is it possible to achieve no. eternal blessings and God without Well, it's not possible to experience anything without sin and death. Because you're born into it. Okay. All right, let's go to the new worksheet. This is uh, worksheet chapter 20. Just four verses, not too much. It's Romans chapter 7, verses 4. Now, we're going to do something funny. All of a sudden now, as he's talking about a free gift, 
um, uh, of grace, uh, being eternal life, talking about freedom, being free from law. Now all of a sudden, he's going to be talking about, and oftentimes this section is called, the, Lord, the lordship of the law, how the law um, is still a part of our life um, in certain ways, uh, but our relationship to the law has been redefined, or at least been changed. So we'll be, and Paul, uh, you know, I mean, he moves so quickly from metaphor to metaphor. You know, he's talking about bearing fruit, and then he's talking about wages and gifts, and now all of a sudden he's going to pivot and talk about marriage. Because right? that obviously launches the whole thing. I don't know. So let's read through Romans chapter 7, verses 1 to 4, and then let's, let's uh, discuss a little bit about what he's talking about. So, or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives, for to bear fruit for death. Oh, what did I do here? Pages are stuck together. Sorry. Uh, for a married woman, let me just start over. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives, for a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ. So that you may be no, or so that you may belong to another, to him who has raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Okay. So now he's pulling in this Mosaic law according to uh, uh, what it, what a marriage relationship is. So one of the things that we need to first recognize, and he does this twice in these opening verses, he says. That it's for the first time well, in a long time, actually going back to chapter 1, he refers to the hearers as brothers. And he does it twice. So knowing that he's doing this, what little, uh, uh, knowing Paul a little better since, since we first had him in the first chapter, what do you think he's preparing us for by using that word? How, how is he referring to, huh? Believers? Well, he's, he's using the word not just believers or saints. Disciples. He's not using the word disciples. He's using the word brothers. So what is he trying, what's he, what's he doing to you right now? Family. He's talking about family, right? And what, what do you think the tone of the next conversation is going to be like? Okay, so we're all on the same level. We're all the same. Okay. What? What? Are, what other? What's the sentiment that's going to be behind these words? Well, Love, gentleness. They're going to be hard words, right? There's going to be some hard things to understand, and this is this should surprise us a little bit, right? Because in chapter six. He basically called them foolish or simple-minded, right? He told them that they were just not smart enough to understand what he was talking about. So he was, he was dumbing down a little bit, right? And so he keeps doing this kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden, he pivots now and he talks to them as brothers. So putting himself on the same plane like you were talking about, talking about uh, opening his heart, you know, it's almost like he's wrapping his arm around their shoulder as they're going on a walk now. Let me tell you about a little bit better about your relationship to the law. It's like a married couple. And so he is now breaking down this metaphor and preparing uh, preparing us for this uh, for this more intimate conversation in a way. Okay? All right, so let's go to chapter 2. So he doesn't just pull this out of thin air. He's not pulling it out of secular society. He's not just using an image that may, might be common for individuals during that time. He's actually quoting the Mosaic Laws from Deuteronomy chapter 24. So let's go ahead and let's turn to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 24. And then, uh, just to I don't know, just keep going, we'll do 1 Corinthians 7, 39. So if one person could do uh, volunteer to read for us that Deuteronomy 24 passage, and then another person have it already, 1 Corinthians 7, 39. And then we'll talk about, we'll talk about the metaphor a little bit. 
So, yes, sir, please. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, he puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house. And if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce, and puts her and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife, then her former husband, who sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God has given you for it in inheritance. So here we go. So there's lots to be talked about with Deuteronomy 24, but let's go to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 7, verse 39. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married, whom she wishes only in the Lord. Okay. All right. So, we're, you know, and when we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 24, he talks about certificates of divorce, which really aren't what we're talking about here, except for the fact that uh, when you look at it, the only thing uh, that really uh, that really separates divorce outside of a certificate of divorce, which Jesus clarifies for us, is only was only given uh, to the Israelites through Moses because of their hard heartedness and their persistence on sinning. And then you have the uh, the final part of that, those last two verses, talking about death and how death liberates. And I don't want to say it that way because this. Does it really liberate a woman from the marriage? I don't think so. But anyway, so <coughs> um, so it talks about death and what frees a woman up to be remarried, um, and and how she's no longer bound to it. That's really interesting. The language that we that we use or that's thrown around oftentimes about marriage, right? Um, you know, it's the word bound. What does that bring to mind? Slavery. Slavery, right? And no wonder the you know the we have some issues with some of these words, right? What or submit, right? Those are it's like it's really part of the premarital counseling nowadays. Like the first couple of sessions, it's just to explain what these words mean, because so many of the new brides don't want these words at all associated with their you know no we're going to mop the floors together. Or I'm not going to. It has nothing to do with that. And actually. There's an, a parochial school down in Illinois where the pastor was giving a, a sermon on marriage and talking about bound and submission in marriage. The whole, the whole uh, student body thought he was talking about sadomasochism and sexual relationships. The, the culture has taken these words and redefined them to a point where they're unrecognizable for future generations. Right? Um, and so... Being able to hear these words and actually reapply them in the proper sense. So what does it mean for husbands and wives to be bound together? They become one. They become one. Right? And there's a whole lot of things that, uh, I had a friend one time that tried to use an analogy. You know, he had a big present box and then he had two shoe boxes in the person. So he was like, here's all of the husband and he put that in there and here's all of the wife and they put the lid on it and here is the present, you know, for the family. And it's not that, you know, it's not that somebody ceases to exist and then all of a sudden we have all these really nasty teachings about being bound and submission and all this other stuff. It's about working in concert. It's about harmony and doing it freely. And, uh, and being committed. And so when we're talking about bound, yes, yes, it's talking about your vows. It's talking about the fact that you are signing a contract in your marriage, right? You are signing it. You're legally married. You're bound to each other just as you're bound to your mortgage. Right? Um, so there's a contractual obligation. And then, and, then I, and honestly, that's not a bad thing at all either because doing marital counseling, I can tell you that there are times where I'm talking with couples and they are going, they are doing these things to make their marriage better because they are legally bound to, right? They've made a commitment. They've promised. And sometimes that promise 
And that commitment is the strongest thing that's there because, you know, when we think about love and everything in the movies, you know, that is not necessarily always the driving force in our marriage. Is that key? Yeah. Look at the social pain and agony that our society is enduring today because of the loose way we view these things. Yep. It's terrible. Yep. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, uh, there's a little tiny book out there. If you're ever interested in reading it, it's fascinating. It's called The, the Ring Makes All the Difference. <clears throat> and the statistics are just, and it's exactly what Keith is talking about, right? Um, it's talking about commitment and fidelity and all those other things and how marriage actually makes all the difference. And talking about, and it breaks it down from individuals that don't live together before marriage, those people that do live together before marriage and then get married, and then those people that decide never to be married. And it goes and talks about everything, the lifestyles, the health, the physical well-being, the, the, the security, raising the children, all of that stuff. And it paints this very vivid picture of these three very distinct lifestyles and what happens. You know, it's interesting, you know, it's, it's, you ever want to scare a young couple to death, you can tell them that it's statistically, right, that if you live together before you're married, you just up your percentage of divorce from 50 to 85. Just automatically. And you want to know why? It goes right to what we're talking about today. It's because if you're living together before you get married, and you get in a really nasty fight, which I know I'm sure none of you guys have ever had in any of your marriages or any of your relationships, what do you think is the number one accusation or statement for an unwed couple married or living together? What's the ultimate threat? Nothing. That's it, I'm done. Right? I'm leaving. And I always tell everybody to practice the way you play. So after they live together for two years, and they threaten for two years that they're leaving each other, then they get married, and they have the great wedding, right? And everything goes great. Six months after, or two months, two weeks after, after they get married, they have another fight over Campbell's or Progressive Soup. <laughs> and what do you think they immediately go to because they've learned a script? Come well, I'm leaving. <clears throat> and this is why it automatically jumps the divorce rate just off through the roof. And the more complications you add to this, um, the higher it actually gets. Um, but there's other things that we can talk about with that. But yeah, the book is called The Ring Makes All the Difference. It scares, scares you to death. But it brings to, to mind everything you're talking about. Because of what that what it means to be bound. Right? And understanding that commitment that's represented there and the unity and the fusion that takes place there. Now that helps us understand kind of the foundation of what Paul's talking about here. He is talking about how our life was indistinguishable from the law. We were united to it in marriage. We were one with it. It was what part of what defined our life, the trajectory of our life. It's how we interacted, not just with, um, with the, the various circumstances of our life, but it oriented our life and it informed how we moved forward in everything that we did. It's just like what marriage ought to be like now. Right? When we live in, as a married couple, we live in unity with one another. Everything, every decision we make is in unison with one another. We're standing beside each other confronting the circumstances of this world as one. And so you take that image of how God ordained marriage and now you apply it to the law. It should be inseparable from you and I. And not, it shouldn't be that you live according to the law in certain situations because you don't live in certain situations as a married person. You're always married. It doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in church or work or wherever, right? You're married. And that's the same thing with the law here. So... You are now the spouse bound to and to submit, yield to, serve the law. It's what makes the entire your, your life. It's what you want. Then. Now the the moving from that foundation. Um, well, yeah. So that's how he's talking about it as a metaphor of Mosaic law. Okay. 
And um, I think we should probably, that's quarter after, so I hate to leave you in the middle of kind of the state. But one thing I want you guys to think about, it's the end of the, it's the, end of the worksheet. But the, Paul's metaphor is really interesting, okay? Because it twists at the end. Because you would think that if you're married to the law, and you want to be set free from the law, what should the law have to do? Or die, right? This is, this is, the law has to die. But does the law die? Who dies? Jesus. We do. And who are we united to? Jesus Christ in our baptism. So the metaphor takes a really strange twist at the end, which is really exciting to think about. Because then there'll be reasons for this. Right? And it affirms a lot of what Christ talked about, a lot of things that happened in the Old Testament. Right? Because does God's will ever die for you? No. no. It's now that we are set free to, uh, as we are united to Christ, to live for Him and to bear fruit that will last. So it's all sorts of, a lot of really good stuff to come. Okay? So, um, don't go away thinking that you're still married to the law in order to have to submit and subdue, subdue yourself and everything like that. Right? The, that's kind of the opposite antithesis of what Paul is talking about here. What he wants to do is get you very fastly in those four short verses to realize that the law, the law hasn't died. That's still very much part of our life. But you have died. And that's what makes your relationship to God completely different than it once was. Because now you're united into Christ, and now you can bring all sorts of beautiful imagery. And, uh, Ephesians five, right? When you get to, um, you know, the the mystery of Christ and the church, and that's marriage, and all sorts of good stuff. All right, guys. <clears throat> Man, I was only gone a week, but my voice is already <laughs> giving out. Oh, all right. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you for today, for this opportunity uh, to be reminded of how we're united to you in our baptism how we have been now uh, given this new life in relationship to the law and giving us the ability through you and through your spirit prompting us and, and living and reigning in and through us to serve you and to bring about peace and patience and gentleness and kindness into this world that we may comfort those who are desperately in need of us and even ourselves at times. Lord, we ask that you would be with us as we go upstairs, as we hear your word, as we are reminded that you are a good shepherd guiding us and bring us together as one. And we ask this, Lord, all in Jesus' name. Amen.